welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to Digital Europe's uh, deep dive. Uh, we have 90 minutes now with an excellent panel to uh, cover the European health data space. Uh, in case you're wondering, it is uh, regulation that's roughly that thick. So uh, we're not going to go through everything. Uh, you'll see that we're going to focus a lot on uh, where the negotiations are happening in Council and soon to kick off in the European Parliament. And uh, that is on uh, primary data. So some of the earlier chapters of this regulation. and, and um, But we will touch upon secondary uh, data as well. Uh, which will be very much, I think, the focus, we hope, in uh, the next year. So uh, to begin, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the communications for this event. And uh, you will see that up on your screen, we have uh, the hashtags um, for tweeting, uh, or if you want to go to LinkedIn, please feel free. Uh, this is being recorded. I need to let everyone know that. Um, if you have an issue with that, then, then please drop off. Uh, there is an opportunity to receive information in our chat, as well as to um, ask questions. Uh, I will try my very best to answer as many as I can, but uh, unlikely I'll answer them all. So just for that, you're aware. Now, who is Digital Europe, in case you do not know? Um, we are a 20-year trade association. We are made up of uh, 41 national trade associations across Europe, and uh, we have 97 corporate members. And as you can see, uh, it's not just the technology providers uh, and ICT providers, but we also have a very, very vibrant uh, transforming industry community from finance and manufacturing to transport. Um, but we also have a very diverse membership of uh, healthcare companies, uh, from pharmaceuticals to med tech to vaccine developers and consumer healthcare insurance companies. So a very, very rich debate. And I'm very happy to have an excellent panel with us today. And I'll just read them out uh, so that you are aware. Um, and I'll also read it out in the running order for the first round so you can expect who's gonna speak. Uh, we're gonna have uh, for uh, an introduction, um, Ankel Martin, who's from Johnson & Johnson. And Ankel um, is the chair of our Digital Health Working Group. Um, but uh, Johnson Johnson also chairs our uh, executive council. And that is a community of executives from companies large and small, including SMEs and developers, talking about uh, the EHDS and uh, important areas for digital health. Uh, then we will set the scene with Victoria uh, Shaportiuk, who is uh, the vice chair of our digital health working group. She's from Siemen Health and Years, a very well-known European medical devices company. Uh, then that will be followed by Dimitri Etin, who is from Oracle. He's the global digital health architect. Uh, we will then move to, uh, and we're very fortunate to have Tomislav Sokol. Uh, Tomislav is an honorable member of the European Parliament and the co-rapporteur of the EHDS from the NV committee. Uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Thomaslav has uh, told us that he would need to leave. He's a very busy gentleman, uh, trying to deal with a lot of issues in the parliament and we're very honored for him to be here, but we'll have to leave a little bit early. So we'll get to him uh, in the first round. Uh, then that will be followed by key stakeholders and the EU institutions. We have uh, Sarah Roda for, uh, as a senior policy advisor from the uh, Healthcare Practitioner Association, the CPMA. We have Veronique Simina, who is a legal officer and policy consultation from the European Data Protection Supervisor, which is great as the GDPR plays an important role in this uh, discussion. And finally, we have Yanni Kumalainen, who is the Senior Ministerial Advisor of the Finnish Ministry of Social Affairs and Health. So just to begin, let me just quickly spend two seconds to uh, talk about what we're aiming to discuss today. Obviously, the European health data space is extremely important. We learned that from COVID. We need a Europe that moves fast. We need a Europe that moves as one. We need a resilience uh, healthcare system uh, that is accessible and provides health equity, uh, and, but one that also can innovate. 
And the EHDS is a very ambitious uh, regulation that is trying to do all that. Uh, but you know, in its ambition, uh, we do see some inconsistencies uh, for the GDPR, and we're going to explore that. Um, it tackles EHR systems in what could possibly be in a very broad way, and the scope is something that will need to be discussed because the EHR uh, 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 market is something that is very vibrant with a lot of potential and a lot of future, and we don't want to limit it. There are several horizontal areas, especially the Data Act, uh, that is in still discussions, and uh, uh, that is going to play an important role, particularly when we look at, uh, at uh, primary health data. And we need to understand how can we get uh, data into a health data system, into a data space, but you know, how can we make sure we avoid some, some risks and uncertainty and it has the right incentives. Uh, standards will be a discussion. And then of course, always, you know, when and how are we gonna cover this very long document before the mandate ends? So the negotiation times, and you know, please be ready when I look at uh, the negotiators, um, be interesting to find out at what speed and how much we can accomplish if we can. So going to the, to, um, before I uh, pass it, I would like to pass it over to uh, uh, Ankel Martin of uh, J&J, our chair, uh, to make some introductory comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, welcome everyone to, to this, I will say, very exciting and probably first uh, session of many because as Ray said, uh, to really unpack everything that is in that uh, piece of paper, a long piece of paper, um, there is a lot to discuss. Um, we really want to that today to be the start of a dialogue, um, a dialogue that we also um, started um, uh, very early on uh, through the creation of our Executive Council for Health. This is a very unique, uh, I would say, platform or group of uh, executives, which is actually combining representatives from the tech industry, from the healthcare, both from the pharma and the medical technology industry, as well as SMEs and startups. So it's really a very interesting combination. And the idea is that um, these um, innovative industries are coming together to discuss some of the opportunities and the challenges that we see in digital transformation, as it couldn't be otherwise, uh, the, the discussion started really around data. Um, and around uh, how, I mean, how can we really bring a data economy into healthcare? Um, and obviously, uh, the very first thing that these executives um, uh, realized is that uh, trust um, is really at the bedrock of everything we're trying to do. It's really of utmost priority, particularly because the nature of the data itself is really sensitive and it needs to be adequately protected. Equally, this data has a very big power actually to, to, um, to address some of the med needs that we see today in healthcare. So, uh, so in discussions among all these, uh, uh, all these different leaders, we were able to come with, uh, with a couple of papers. Um, and I'm gonna highlight uh, particularly one today, which is the one that you see at the bottom, uh, where we really trying to really uh, let's say, uh, unpack the four tenets that we think are essential uh, for building trust, you know? So that we can really use data ethically, that we respect privacy and security, and we know we're gonna be talking about that in a minute, and all that leads to a trustworthy environment where we can use data for innovation. And the very first tenet um, clearly is around uh, demonstrating the benefits. So. We need to demonstrate benefits for all health communities, from patients to healthcare professionals, also to policymakers. We should think of how we are communicating also the risks of not using uh, database technologies in healthcare, which are really uh, showing clear uh, good outcomes for patients, for systems, reducing costs, and also even making it easier for, for patients to, to be in control of their own health. So demonstrating the benefits, talking about the benefit is extremely important. Um, I would say second, uh, although it features there um, the last one, I would say even it's probably the first, is really that anything we do needs to be obviously with the patient at the center. 
But that patient at the center brings also a key challenge that we all see, which is around the literacy that uh, we need to upskill, we need to upgrade among patients, but also healthcare professionals, and I would say even data scientists and technology. So I think there is really something that we need to do around literacy so that we really bring um, this data uh, economy really across the board uh, at all levels um, and certainly uh, upskilling um, professionals, as I said before, both on the healthcare side, but also on the technology and the data science side will be crucial. Um, the other uh, the other tenet I would like of the pillar that we would like to, to underline is obviously around privacy um, and security, so data protection by design. Um, and when we develop in uh, frameworks and, and policies, including the European health data space, we need to have all these considerations. I mean, technology can be helpful, can really help, and actually there are already, I would say, uh, cutting edge uh, approaches actually in, in how to protect data and still get the insights and the value of that data. Uh, but we certainly need to, to bring more standardization. Uh, we need to be able to scale these experiences. Um, and I think the European health data space is certainly an opportunity to do that. Also, uh, basically leveraging pretty much uh, the very good collaboration and partnerships, which are already happening uh, both within the private and the public sector. Um, and this brings me to, to the final one. I think uh, something that we don't do enough probably, uh, and that includes also healthcare, is to really leverage uh, best practices and existing successes. I think we already know there are things that are working. So uh, as I said before, also for privacy and security, is there an opportunity to scale up those good experiences, um, those successes that are really bring, as I said, this trustworthy system uh, that will really foster and unlock the power of data. So those are really key elements that we're looking into uh, much more, obviously. And today we have, uh, I would say, an impressive panel of experts that are going to really give us more insights and more color to all these different dimensions. So with this, uh, Ray, I'm handing over to you. Obviously, I'm going to be here around for any questions that you might have for me. Thank you. Ankel, thank you very much. And we're going to get back to you uh, later on because one area we'd like to talk about and a big focus is innovation. It is secondary data, uh, but let's let's go through primary. Um, and I, before we begin uh, and start the panel, I just want to highlight one very important thing. We have now close to 200 participants, uh, uh, well over 150 that have joined. And I hope the participants are going to be those that uh, uh, came together and drafted this document uh, well over 30 um, uh, NGOs, academics, industry players uh, came together and uh, uh, put this letter uh, that we are calling our consensus statement. Why? Because we came together and very quickly were able to find a consensus on seven very important areas. And let me call them out very quickly. Stakeholders across the board need to be involved in this process. We need to be there. Uh, whenever you know uh, bodies are being set up by the EHDS and in the discussions that are happening at member state level and in the negotiations, we play a very important role. Um, if we're you know a uh, NGO representing cancer patients or cardiology, uh, medical devices, if we're looking at rheumatology or eye or fertility or patient European patients forums. You know, we all really need to be part of these discussions. And um, the second point is that uh, this EHS is going to need to make sure that it aligns uh, or the uh, horizontal uh, files such as the Data Act or the AI Act aligns with this. And we can't have a disjointed uh, way forward uh, and a lot more discussions need to happen across all these horizontal files uh, and more care to clarify areas such as the GDPR. We need to be able to implement the EHDS in a very harmonized way. Uh, we can't have 27 different ways of the EHDS or access permits or, you know, make permits or get secondary data or or you know, have different systems uh, operating you know, in their siloed way as health systems have been very siloed to date. So we need to address that. We need to make sure that the approval for secondary data is consistent across the EU. Um, we need a clear definition 
of e EHR systems. And that's something we're gonna get to very quickly. It has to be resourced because it's gonna have costs. So we need to make sure it's adequately resourced. And then the other thing is, and this ties to the first one, is there are communities that are working very well with the private sector and the public sector with NGOs and academia. This community is intrinsically intertwined. They don't operate separately. They work very closely together. Uh, they're very tight knit data collaboration communities and we should not upset that. We need to make sure that is in place. Please read this letter. Um, uh, it's up on our website or any of our uh, uh, signatories who have signed it. And uh, you know, if you're an official out there in this audience, please support the recommendations we are making. So I will now begin to uh, introduce uh, Victoria from Siemens Health and Nearance. Victoria, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to you know, just ask you about EHR systems. I've mentioned this several times and, and we're talking about an EHDS that can enable in achieving the uh, 2030 target, um, but not putting a burden on innovators. Um, how can this happen? Hi, Ray, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for, um, for the panel. Um, I think that's um, a very important question to start because um, as we know, uh, EHDS is part of the um, broader strategy to digitalize the European economy um, and digitalize, uh, well, pretty much uh, every, every sector of our lives. Um, and I think, um, particularly on the EHDS, we have to acknowledge that that is a very ambitious target. It's a very ambitious legislation. Um, and it's here for a reason, and we need to keep in mind that HDS is an instrument, but it's not an aim in itself. Um, and um, indeed, a lot will depend on the implementation and, and enforcement. And for that, we very much uh, support the EHDS consensus that we uh, have been able to find between 29 stakeholders and more will even co-sign it because uh, we, we know why we uh, need this piece of legislation. We need, uh, we understand all of us very well, uh, why is it here and why we are working very hard on it to become um, an effective um, and important uh, legal framework on which we can achieve very important goals. Those being that we're doing it to achieve uh, better healthcare. We're doing it so that through the coverage of the population with the EHR, through the setting up of the EHR systems on the cross-national basis, we can offer European patients um, an improved uh, healthcare delivery so that they can enjoy better, um, better prevention, diagnosis, improved uh, treatment. Uh, we can help the healthcare professionals be more effective um, in, their in their daily jobs. In the end, of course, it's all about the, um, the improvement of the patient outcomes. And I think this is something very important to keep in mind because that should inform our efforts and our thinking, and we should judge um, our actions if they can uh, bring us closer to the achievement of these, of these goals um, and all the efforts. And those would be a lot. We need to um, understand that these are... Um, these are performed because they can help us to achieve exactly those goals. Um, and in terms of the perspective from the innovators, of course, um, uh, we, as you mentioned already, already before, we have so many legislative proposals on the table. Um, we are very highly regulated industry um, and we don't shy away from a regulation. I think that's very clear because we have been operating under sophisticated framework for, for decades with the medical devices framework, of course. Um, however, um, what can be a certain hurdle in the, um, in, um, in the efforts on the, that drive the HDS is that we see more and more the the, the regulatory environment is becoming like a maze or a labyrinth of requirements, and the industry is already struggling to understand what is needed in terms of compliance, which rules to follow, um, and over the span of the last two years, we saw so many proposals that made this so much more complicated, so much more complex, and in generally, it's not it's not productive when the when the biggest challenge 
is the compliance and to understanding how to achieve that. All right, let me let me just yeah. uh, um, just uh, interrupt if I may, and and these are very good points because uh, ecosystems or people who are innovating uh, are huge. Just Digital Europe's uh, ecosystem is forty five thousand SMEs that are innovating, and uh, you know so it is a very important important point you're making. But just very briefly, I want to go back to EHRs and and is the definition very broad and and would that create any unwanted effects? Well, I mean, currently, of course, we understand that the, um, yeah, so from our perspective, the definition is that, uh, a bit too broad. Um, and I think, for example, uh, if we look at the text, uh, we see that the EHRs should cover any software that is able of storing, intermediating, importing, exporting, converting, editing, or viewing electronic health records. And that's that's very broad because... Um, if you think about it, even regular medical devices that are able to store certain information about uh, a patient, for example, an image, uh, could potentially qualify as an HR system. However, also reading the uh, regulation, reading the impact assessment, we understand that that was not the primary goal of the European Commission, neither it is probably the goal of the co-legislators to cover everything. Mm -hmm. So our suggestion is that the definition should focus on what is accurate and what is realistic. Therefore, we think that um, the definition should reflect that the primary and, intent, and the intended purpose of the HR system uh, should be the ability to retain the um, patient information and facilitate its flow between the healthcare professionals, for instance. Uh, and the exact wording, of course, will be worked out in the due process. Um, and this is particularly because we need to clearly delineate uh, the requirements between different frameworks and to make this as um, comprehensible as possible um, exactly to support the ecosystem. Excellent, Victoria. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you shortly. Uh, Dimitri, if we can move over to you um, and, you know, uh, continuing, you know, the, the look at the proposal as it stands. Uh, let's get a little bit technical. Let's talk about better coordination of standards. Uh, are we on the right track? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure being here in this panel. Um, so, I think yeah, I think it's it's always uh, it's always a challenging question when you look at, at the framework proposal like this one. You always come to a question: so, how this is going to be implemented? And in order to implement this, we need certain specifications and standards to follow. So, what was happening so far, and what still kind of brings a lot of questions to me or to us when we read the proposal itself is that on one hand we've got the, we've got this kind of uh, positive aim at normalizing uh, legislation and specifications so how to implement things across the member states. However, up until now, uh, quite a few member states, especially when we talk about HDS1, so for the primary use, there's been a lot of efforts already done for today. And Victoria just mentioned, for instance, a too broad uh, definition of EHRs. And that also immediately comes to a question, all of the things that the member states did up till now, which is called either shared care records or national EHR systems, does it also fall under this future certification? So the member states did a lot of efforts. They ran a lot of uh, certification process, so to speak, so so-called in technical world, connectathons in order to uh, certify vendors who actually bid for those uh, systems, the HDS1 systems, is it also gonna end up being kind of secondly, or we need the duplicate effort in order to certify something which has actually was created by the member states themselves. So trying to kind of normalize this whole thing, we've seen a lot of, a lot of activity going on uh, in some joint actions like XC Health, program, for instance, or now when ICSI health program is being complete, there is another joint action called expand the age. They all try to specify. So what is that we are trying to implement? And that is that is impossible to actually disconnect when we think about HRs, actually those requirements that are put in place through the specification development programs, they actually advise how those HR systems has to act. And now what kind of looks like as a overlook in a way, is that everything what is being specified today concerns primary use. 
we specify the number of uh, different types of information that we want to share, how to access this information, what kind of information we collect. We create a lot of information models that define different types of documents. For now, there are five, six categories that we want to exchange, and they going to end up being fetched off HR systems and indexed and made available for primary use. However, there is no specification so far that actually allows us to bridge from HDS1 from the primary use to the secondary use. And I think this is one of the major challenges that we foresee today. So for some reason, there are a lot of legal reasons, ethical and uh, privacy reasons that we operate HDS1 and HDS2, but we still keep, we keep developing specifications separately for HDS1, for primary use and for secondary use. And this lack of bridge and the specifying actually how we're going to benefit in the secondary use from what we collect during the HDS one. So all the specifications today just focus on this one. And I think we have to think more about whether and how we're gonna build this today because it's not an empty space. So we do take international standards and we do try to coordinate between all the member states. I think the same could be done for the bridging between you know, primary use of data and secondary use of data. There is a lot of working groups internationally which support this work. This is not like Europe is doing this alone. There's a number of efforts out there that could help us you know, bring this quite quickly, make some shortcuts and not to reinvent the wheel. But today we don't even see a lot of work being done between connecting you know, HDS1 and HDS2. So there is a lot we can do together to make it a little better and make this data a little more available between the two. And, and Dimitri, this is super important what you're saying, because uh, when you look at global research, it's not happening in the EU. It's happening in the US, it's happening 40%, it's happening in China, uh, you know, over 13%. And uh, we don't wanna create a system uh, that will make it very difficult, uh, you know, for AI to learn, for machine learning, for the development of AI technologies and using European data. Um, I'll get back to you, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to you shortly. But I'd like to get to uh, Mr. Sokol, uh, Mr. Sokol Tomislav. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you have a very important and monumental task before you, and you're one of the co rapporteurs uh, dealing with uh, the EHDS. And, and I'd really like to ask you that you know the Commission with their digital uh, decade targets are aiming for 100% of citizens have access to their electronic health records by 2030. It's a big focus, uh, EHR and EHR systems in the EHDS, but how can the EHDS enable the development in this field, achieving a target without the increased burden on healthcare professionals and innovators? Uh, over to you, please. Thank you very much. First, thank you for inviting and organizing this this panel uh, on primary use because uh, most of most of the discussions that we had so far with stakeholders actually more focused on the issues of secondary use of data. But I think primary use is also very, 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 very important. And actually, that is that is the primary objective why EHDS was created in the first place to to facilitate the use of data and exchange of data between healthcare professionals and all and also to use them for individual patients' health benefits. When it, when it, when we speak about EHDS and uh, contributing to achieving the dig, the digital targets, I think uh, it it the idea is that it that it should contribute. Uh, but it is important. Uh, it's not the only the only thing that we have to take into account. But we all, but it also should not uh, provide additional obstacles. So I have to say that in general I agree that uh, that Europe is too regulated, too much bureaucratic, too many new rules, too many parallel rules. So rules which regulated the same thing but in a slightly different way. Too too uh, too many new layers of additional uh, certifications that you have that you. Ha have to fulfill and that is the problem uh, so uh, so definitely the hds if we get it done should facilitate the uh, the use of data and access to data electronic health records but it is important that the that while preserving the main principles of the proposal we also clear, clear more clearly define some areas and do not impose additional burdens on the healthcare on, on the healthcare professionals but on the manufacturers as well uh, when we speak of uh, when we speak of this of course uh, it is not just a question of this concrete legislation it will also be about funding so especially on the national on the national level 
running on, on on infrastructure, which is very important. Also, we will have to take we will have to invest a lot into digital literacy of the health of the health professionals. So because we will the whole new ecosystem will be created and we will have to make sure that healthcare professionals know how to deal with this uh, because it, because the situation is very diverse some member states have have really uh, went uh, very far in terms of creating the, the, the electronic health records and uh, and uh, making them interoperable within within uh, within their national healthcare systems but some have not in some countries uh, you cannot ex exchange data it does not have interoperability of health data between two hospitals within the same system so this so all, so these differences will mean that we will have to invest a lot into both this infrastructure but also into education and explaining how uh, to the professionals who will have to conduct uh, conduct a lot of these issues will uh, will have to work but also we have to be careful that we do not impose unreasonable burdens burden upon them especially administrative burden and I have to say, what from what I'm seeing, I'm actually come from the higher educational sector. That that the more digital so solutions we have, this does not reflect into simplifying the way how we do things. It just usually adds new layers of new procedures that we have to comply with. So this is something that that really that really that really will, we will have to tackle, and we should make sure that we do not do not overregulate again, do not impose additional burdens. On the on the on the on the healthcare professionals, but manufacturers as well. Uh, when we uh, when 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 we speak of uh, concrete things uh, related to the H, to the HDS, I agree that the definition of EHR is too broad, and this is something that that we will have that we will have to uh, work a lot on, and also how to align that was that has already been said align, align definitions and implementation of different pieces of legislation which are regulated similar similar issues like the AI A Act. For instance, so these are, and of course, the GDPR. That's that's a separate question. So about data protection, but if we get into discussing second use of data, I think it will be uh, special, special relevant there. So definitely, the the biggest work that I expect to do, expect to do in relation to the EHDS, will be about the definitions, about how to make all of these different rules fit together, how to how to more clearly uh, define what is EHR so that so that it is re it really the definition only covers really what it should cover the the, the purpose of it the, the which is the purpose of the of the of the proposal of the proposal itself and to and to and to regulate the system in a way that it does not provi uh, provide provide uh, in uh, impose too too much additional burden upon all the all the stakeholders involved especially healthcare professionals who will i think especially the, in the beginning uh, they will they will have a lot of things of new things to handle and we should make sure that really that this this burden is not is not uh, too too much um so i think that ehds can really be a game changer i think it has it it has the, it has that potential but definitely but def definitely the whole idea of this is, will be to to use data more easily to facilitate actually the use of data to create this interoperable uh, system but not to impose addition additional layers of new things uh, that everybody has to comply with of, of course uh, how how we will do it uh, that 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 will be defined by the report and interinstitutional negotiations. Obviously, I cannot go into more detail th than this, but uh, I can say that my political group and I myself are really open to the uh, to, to the issues uh, which are important for the industry as well. We know that industry is our partner, so we cannot do without industry, even though some uh, political groups uh, in the European Parliament don't think the same way, but uh, but def definitely we will have to work together to make sure that this whole system uh, system works. And of course, I, I also want to say, since I'm also a member of the Internal Market Committee, we are also fighting there against creating new new burdens and new obstacles and new and new impediments and, uh, and new things that, and, uh, that, that that everybody that uh, market operators have to comply with so this is so you can so, so there there as well we are always uh, communicating with the commission that uh, they should maybe sometimes slow down a bit with some, with some with some things we know that uh, more than 100 new legislative proposals uh, are in plan for by the commission by the end of this mandate to to come to the parliament and the council and uh, this is something that is not bad per se but if you want to be competitive especially when compared to the us and china we should really take a long look into what exactly we are trying to achieve there so that uh, that we do not so we are over regulated now that we don't go into two into even more regulation in the future
Um, uh, Tomislav, thank you. Thank you very much. Those are all very comforting and welcoming comments. I think everyone on the panel will agree with you. Um, I do hope you can you can stay a, a little bit longer. I know that uh, you have to leave. Um, I'll try to get back to you before before you have to leave at uh, 10 minutes to. Uh, we do have some other uh, speakers on this panel that are going to address some issues that are going to be quite relevant to the work that you have to do. Uh, you know, we're going to be looking at some of these definitions in the GDPR uh, that can be vague. They can be inconsistent in defining, you know, what is a data holder. Uh, there's going to be questions in regards to the Data Act, uh, the permitting, self-permitting, and uh, uh, who can permit. I mean, there is some uh, peculiar language where uh, essentially maybe a rogue state could ask for health data at the moment. So these type of things really do have to be addressed and fixed. Um, but uh, let, me, let me get back to you hopefully before you go. And, and thank you for these comments. Uh, I'd like to just jump over to Sarah. Sarah is uh, representing healthcare practitioners. Um, I think some of the comments you've heard from uh, Mr. Sokal will be uh, uh, definitely uh, something you'd want to hear, particularly in regards to, to uh, excessive burden. Uh, and I know that uh, the brunt of, of, of healthcare systems fall on the shoulders of healthcare practitioners. So you're representing a very important uh, stakeholder group. Let me ask you, 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 you proposed a, a paper that, that I've read recently on uh, the once only principle. Um, I'd like to you know maybe if you can elaborate a little bit uh, on you know what that is and, and what that means exactly. Yes, uh, thank you so much and uh, good morning and thank you again for the invitation. Um, so the once on only principle came uh, to light because we see that uh, the regulation as the MEP Sokol mentioned will bring a lot of burdens to, to doctors, particularly in primary use, but it also have uh, obligations for them for secondary use, which is something that we do not agree. And so this come uh, uh, as a corollary and try to, to have something that is realistic and then not impose impossible goals to, to the health workforce. So the once only principle um, would be to, to, to allow for doctors to only provide data for primary use, so focus only uh, on the primary care um, uh, um, diagnosis and treatment directly with the patient, so the patient-doctor relationship, and then uh, it would be up to the um, competent authority that is managing the electronic health uh, record system to make that data available for secondary use according with the law. So this would be the main uh, idea of the once-only principle. Uh, and this because in the EHTS, um, the data holders, the doctors can fit into the definition of data holders. And so they do should have to make the data available to health data access bodies. This can pose a, a, a lot of problems. It can be one request come, uh, or it can be several requests several times a day. And so the core activity of a doctor is towards the patient. And uh, we believe that this can also jeopardize other parts um, of the patient-doctor relationship, uh, uh, particularly in relation to professional secrecy and and medical confidentiality and certain principles of medical ethics. So for us, it would be core and specifically, specifically when we are uh, under a critical moment in the health workforce with the long-term shortages, exhaustion and increased burnouts, uh, these new obligations would be uh, very problematic. And so this could be an easy way out to have this once only principle. Sarah, thank you very much. And you know, I've been noticing that in this discussion, all stakeholders have questions about this regulation. Um, but at the end of the day, right, and uh, this is a message to you as well, Mr. Sokol, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's something you believe in uh, fiercely, uh, this regulation is trying to address something that is important and missing in the European healthcare system. And uh, if member states push back too much, and if we cut, cut it down too much, how many babies are going to be thrown out of the bathwater, right, as we say. So, you know, we have to make sure that there is, that it's a system that can innovate, we have to make sure that there is uh, health quality and equity, but we've got to make sure that's not a burden to the healthcare practitioners because they're already uh, heavily burdened and uh, there seems to be a lot uh, in regards to what they have to deliver. And, and I think, you know, I want to ask you this one question, Sarah, you know, can we get that balance is the first question. And the second question is, um, it's very interesting on these uh, secure processing environments, right? There's a big S on that environments. 
And, you know, does this mean that my clinician that's just down the road who has, you know, just one receptionist, which is shared, will have to create a massive, highly complex, multi-standardized, secure uh, 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 data processing environment? Uh, you know, shouldn't we not just have one data processing environment at national level or heaven for friend, should it not be at EU level? And that would be the very beneficial uh, uh, health data space where data can actually um, uh, be processed in, in such an environment. And I know that's difficult because there's some uh, member state restrictions, but, and we're looking at a very federated model, which is, you know, uh, probably going to deliver, you know, or come short to, you know, the full potential of such a regulation. So I'm throwing a lot of questions that you don't have to answer that. It's actually for the whole panel, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, so for the, the balance part, so that is indeed the, the tricky question, how we can have this, uh, all, all the positive aspects of the regulation, which, which indeed it can be very good in, in terms of outcomes and what they can be delivering, so we should try to make it the, the best of this regulation, and so for us, uh, we have to ensure that the electronic health record remains as a suitable clinical tool, because this, we should not forget that this is indeed a clinical tool for doctors, so the, the usability of the electronic electronic health records must be maintained as a priority. And we see that many information will be connected to the electronic health records. And this can be very hard for the doctor to find relevant and useful information in the electronic health uh, record, uh, because we will have medical devices connected to it. Then there is the risk also of uh, wellness apps, especially if they are not certified. So on these points, for example, what doctors recommend is that they only be added into the system in agreement uh, with a patient and of course the doctor that is treating because there is so many apps out there that do not have the quality and being up for the doctor and missing some useful information because you have a lot of data from from apps it would be not useful for the patient so only add uh, information that uh, uh, has been in agreement and the doctor says this is a good system that you that you can use and to be useful for for you in the future uh, and also easy ways for the doctor to to specify in queries uh, uh, the relevant information and relevant uh, fields be highlighted um, so we we also and in relation to the to the second part um, I think uh, if one processing environment, how we do deal this or not. So interoperability comes here as the big game changer and uh, we cannot expect to only have one. This can be possible for certain countries that are more centralized. So Portugal was developing one uh, uh, app where you can have this and their goal to have this universal uh, electronic health record. In other countries, this is not possible because you have uh, um, different uh, regimes and you have a federated state and they have co competence at national level, but you can also um, see new possibilities and softwares that are coming that are innovative and uh, can bring uh, um, new ideas so the interoperability is able to to work with these systems and of course what is an individual practice that has to do this comes down to the other parts of the costs and the digitalization of the costs and uh, and and this we would need the help of of member states um, on this to make sure that uh, we only we don't force doctors to digitalize, so only, it should be voluntary, and uh, we have to make sure that only those that are willing to digitalize, they should receive compensation uh, for it. Okay, uh, Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to you, and I'm very happy that you joined our panel and, and very open to have these discussions with us uh, offline and online. I'd like to go now to, to Veronique, and, and maybe Veronique... Um, uh, I can ask you just one quick question, and I'd like to get back to Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sokal before he leaves, and then I'll come back to you if you don't mind. But very quickly, um, uh, when we look at at uh, you know uh, data protection authorities trying to tackle primary versus secondary health data, you know how will that how will that be done? Is there you know do you have a view? Thank you very much. We we already had. Uh -huh. Hi, you, uh, sorry, I, I misunderstood. Uh, no, are you okay to just stay for maybe another five minutes? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, great. So maybe Veronique, we can answer that question, and then I wouldn't mind Mr. Sokal just providing you know some some last thoughts before he has to jump off. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thank you for for having me today. Um, the panel. So, um, well, briefly, um, I would say that 
the the authorities um, highlighted also in the in the joint opinion, uh, the EDPB and the EDPS joint opinion that was uh, released on was published in in July uh, on the uh, health data space proposal that indeed the data protection authorities need to be involved somehow um, in the in the whole process. Um, how this will be done is is of course still I think uh, slightly slightly unclear um, when it comes to uh, to I mean when we will then enter maybe the the more detailed discussion also with regards to the definitions um, but also to the rights to data subjects that are provided in the proposal um, there is sometimes a bit of a of an overlap with uh, other uh, proposals um, and, and and acts and also uh, with with the GDPR as such so. In sum, I think the the role of the data protection authorities is unchanged because, of course, the GDPR uh, fully applies, um, and the and the and the data protection authorities um, need to uh, continue, of course, um, you know, um, enforcing uh, the GDPR. Um, on the other hand, however, the data protection authorities surely will need to be involved also in the um, new um, system that will be created, uh, including, for example, a possible board that will be created in the context of secondary use. So um, the role of the of the DPAs, uh, of course, I would say um, increases and not decreases in in, in my view, um, and and they will need to be, of course, fully involved, uh, as we have been, of course, consulted jointly as uh, you know the, the European Data Protection Board and the DPS jointly um, but we will uh, for sure I mean short answer is for sure the, the DPAs need to continue enforcing the GDPR and also make sure that as such the 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 proposal and the new um, let's say provisions and all of the data that is being uh, shared etc still complies with uh, the GDPR principles. Okay, uh, Veronique, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, don't go away. I have many more questions for you. Uh, a great opportunity to talk to a data protection authority. Uh, but uh, if I just go back uh, to Mr. Sokol, and I know you have to leave, but uh, maybe some final thoughts on your side. And, and, and one question from us, uh, you have all these stakeholders here uh, on the panel. I hope you're going to include us and challenge us and and, and request our presence to engage in dialogue as uh, you work towards your opinion. Uh, but is there an area, uh, you know, for us uh, that, you know, some questions you'd like to ask or some comments uh, from what you've heard? Thank, thank you very much. That's a very good question. But I already had had meetings with uh, with many of the of the stakeholders who are who are actually involved here. So definitely, so and in general, I had. I think more than 30 meetings with stakeholders so far, and I think <clears throat> that is very important. Whenever I make a, whenever I make a report uh, or an opinion in the parliament, I always try to get the stakeholders' opinions uh, first, so from all from all parts, so the, including the industry, the 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 patient the patient groups, and the healthcare professionals. I think these are crucial. Let's say three crucial groups of stakeholders. So the, so definitely we, we are already in, in discussions. We are we are we already have. Uh, meetings uh, and exchanges of information, and we will work on that in the moment. In the future, I will also uh, would 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 do what I can to also strengthen the role of stakeholders within this whole institutional setup that will, that will be created by the by the health data space regulation. I think that it's important that they, in some form, also take part in decision making, or, or at least that their voices are heard, so that their role is also more institutionalized than it's in its current proposal. Uh, about uh, the the data protection, yes, I think the, the the crucial overarching question of the regulation will be how to. Uh, uh, achieve or maintain uh, adequate data protection, while on the other hand, actually facilitating the use of data. Because we know that GDPR is, uh, the, as this broad horizontal uh, re regulation is applied differently in different member states. I personally think that the whole setup of the GDPR was not done in the in the right way, so that you have this kind of very broad horizontal regulation, which is then the, which should be implemented by also by private persons, uh, 
uh, companies, uh, universities, etc. For instance, I work at two universities, I teach at two universities, and they have uh, two completely different interpretations on what, when I can publish uh, student data, when I publish uh, the results of the exams, for instance. So which uh, which uh, information I can I can publish on our internal server or not. So things like that. So so I think that so I think that this whole uh, that the concept of GDPR was not very well th thought through, and this is one of the problems that we have. But of course, GDPR is here now. Uh, this regulation does not supply the GDPR, but we have to see how they, they can, how they can fit together. Um, also, what is important when we speak of uh, of the role of different institutions, I agree because uh, we have the data protection bodies, but now we will have also held data access bodies. So the, this whole system which will be created on national on the national level, and then we will have the HDS board on European level. And I think and definitely we have to regulate more precisely what is the role of, and how how that interplay between them also works. That, that that is one of the that is one of the things which will be very very important uh and also one last point about which they uh, about the the too much inflow of data so uh, for the healthcare professionals i would like to refer to article 5 of the regulation where you have the defi uh, defined priority categories of health data to be used uh, for primary, uh, for the uh, to be part of primary use of data. So I think that this is something that is kind of the whole point, and this is the the main. This 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 is the data which should be the focus in the area of primary use. But we'll see whether this can also be regulated in a much in a clear in a clearer way. Also, I agree with with the secondary use of data. It's not the primary purpose that that healthcare professionals are the ones. Who manage, who manage this data and provide it uh, for secondary use? We already had discussions on this. I know about this, about 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 this about this topic. So we will do we will do what we can to try to regulate regulate this more precisely. And just one last point about the timetable, which uh, and just to make sure how all how this uh, whole process, so legislative process, works on European level because it's not always clear. So I will not be making an opinion. I will be making the report. Some other committees will make the opinions. So what does it mean? It means first you have the commission which proposes similar as on the national level you have the government which proposes the legislation and then you have to get the parliament where we have a direct elected MEPs and the council where representatives ministers of member states sit to come to an agreement on this which means that first we have to define the parliament's position and then after that we have to negotiate with the council with the member states in the council on the final on the final agreement so within the parliament, the process is that first a lead committee is defined. This is the committee which appoints the rapporteur, and uh, which makes and which makes the report, which is then voted on in the in the plenary. However, in this case, uh, the first committee which, which was avoided, which was decided to be the the lead committee with the rapporteur, was the Libe committee, committee on civil liberties, and this is the committee which is in charge of data protection implementation of gdpr etc but has nothing to do with healthcare and uh, and uh, we in envy in the committee on public health we challenged this decision because uh, we uh, our position was that the health data is very specific is it, specific it has very very uh, specific um, problems and issues which are which are which are which are only uh, applicable to the healthcare sector and for that reasons we wanted to be at least involved on the same level as the committee on civil liberties and then after several months of discussions the, the decision was made that we will have two lead committees so 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 we will make one joint report so by uh, the, the envy committee and me as the rapporteur of the envy public health committee and the rapporteur from the civil liberties committee so this will be joint report and both committees will vote on this report in the end and then we go to the plenary uh, so so why so and then of course there will be other committees committee on internal market and committee on research who will do uh, who will give their opinion this opinion is is not uh, mandatory. It's not compulsory, but it also defines the position, and uh, and we as rapporteurs can include some parts of these opinions from these other committees, also from from their own uh, com uh, area of competence into the final report. So it, it all sounds pretty complicated. Actually, it is. So we first we have to we will have to make a joint report of two joint rapporteurs from two lead committees. Then we'll have uh, negotiations within those two committees between political groups, because they will also make their own amendments, and then we will have to find the majority on that. And after that, we go to the plenary. So I expect all of the, the, this whole process. I hope we will be able to finish by summer in the parliament. 
uh, the first draft report should be ready at the beginning of February, but after that we'll, we'll start the political negotiations with other political groups, and I hope that all of this finishes, and, but that's optimistic, I have to say, uh, by, by summer. And then that would mean that, that after summer we can engage in negotiations with the member states in the Council, to hopefully to be able to, to, to make the, the final agreement before the end of this, uh, this mandate, this, because you know that our mandate finishes in the middle of 2024. But of course, um, when 2024 starts, everybody is focused on the elections and campaigning and being on lists, etc. So it will not be possible to, to, to have a lot of work done then. So what we, will have to, we will have to try to find the agreement with the council by the end of uh, 2023. So, the, uh, so, uh, so if all of this sounds very long, it, this, is really, uh, this is not so long according to European standards. This process is especially for this very novel pieces of legislation usually take a long time. Uh, so I think everybody told, uh, is telling me that this timetable that I, that I will try to implement is very optimistic, uh, but you don't have a choice. This is the, mo the most important piece of health legislation that we will be able to adopt within this mandate because the pharma legislation is now again postponed for several months. I'm very skeptical about the uh, pharma legislation re the revision being able to be finished by the end of this mandate. So I think we will have to really focus on this to at least get this done uh, before our mandate expires. Uh, so, uh, so this is how all of this will work. Of course, we will engage stakeholders further in different discussions. I also already uh, told them everybody to send me concrete proposals for concrete amendments, concrete provisions. Of course, I cannot promise that I will include everything in, in the first draft, but I will do whatever I can to try to include as much as, as, much as possible and to, to find the balance report in the end. Excellent. Mr. Mr. Sokol, thank you very much for your time and, and for that very in-depth uh, uh, overview. Uh, good luck with uh, the report and, uh, of course, good luck with working with uh, your co-rapporteur and the other committee. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we thank will you. jump back. Yes, thank you. Have a good day, please. And uh, let's jump back to uh, you, Veronique. Um, uh, we won't delve into the uh, questions on the GDPR as a whole, but maybe we can talk about some, some clarity that we're all waiting for in regards to some guidelines that the uh, uh, data protection authorities uh, have promised to send, uh, particularly on research uh, and the anonymization, pseudo-anonymization of data. And as you're gonna feel that we're start shifting now a little bit more towards secondary data in our discussion. Mm -hmm. So uh, why don't you just let us know uh, when we can expect that or if you've heard any news. Yes, so uh, thank you, thank you for this. So indeed, um, maybe just just to 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 give a short, a short uh, let's say preamble, I would say that indeed also for the data protection authorities uh, currently drafting, uh, the um, guidelines on, on scientific research. Um, this, I mean, the, the, the EHDS proposal has, has been a change, a changing factor also for, say, for the work. So uh, at this point in time, indeed, we are trying to, to ensure that there is some sort of, of consistency um, and that indeed the, um, the guidelines um, provide uh, for uh, for specific uh, instructions and and, and and guidance as to uh, for example the, uh, the the concept of further processing um, and you know how how does this now intertwine with the whole definition of secondary use um, but also the different uh, roles and responsibilities of the parties involved uh, so for example you know the whole controllership joint controllership uh, and processorship which is which is often very much you know uh, an issue um in in, in, in for for the, the different uh, entities involved in also in clinical trials for example identifying who's the the controller processor etc so we're going to try and uh, come up with uh, specific interpretations also of concepts that still need uh, interpretation um, and uh, clarification in particular. Um, and then this also applies, of course, for the uh, update of the guidelines on anonymization. Um, I think uh, it can be safely said that both of them should should um, be adopted next year. Um, we, I, but I cannot I cannot now say. Uh, indeed what uh, where will the timing be because of course this will depend also on the work is being done and indeed also 
uh, the, the DPAs are, are, are very overloaded uh, in, at the moment. Um, so it will, I think it is kind of safe to say that in theory, in theory, the, 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 the deadline should, or I mean, the planned timeline should be next year at this point in time. But okay. hopefully it will be, you know, will provide for clarification somehow. We are holding our breath and waiting for these guidelines. It's bigger than the next book of Game of Thrones. So <laughs> please, please produce them. Uh, industry needs clarity. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but uh, I'm going to be going soon to, to Yanni of uh, the Finnish government. Uh, but before I go there, and he's been very patient uh, 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 listening to this, and I'd like his thoughts on, on what a lot has been said here, uh, because in my mind, Finland is, a, is an exceptional model, a working model. Um, but I want to ask you, Veronique, before we jump to, to Finland, is... Um, uh, when you look and, if, and you know, uh, Digital Europe, we produced a paper very much to provide content for those guidelines. And mm -hmm. there are some certain cases where, you know, the data does need to be identifiable. And I'll give you an example, uh, you know, in the development of vaccines, uh, you know, had we known or were able to tell individuals that these vaccines could have been detrimental to their health and safety. Uh, mm -hmm. That would have been important. And the data that we got, you know, from those individuals to, you know, uh, uh, improve those vaccines also is uh, life saving. So, you know, how can we do that? Um, you know, how can we have that ability, uh, particularly when you're developing, you know, very important uh, medicines? Yes. Well, thank you for this. I, I, I for this question, I, I would maybe like to start by by saying that indeed um, the GDPR is always seen a bit. You know, there are two two themes. One team sees the GDPR as as offering too much flexibility, so the rules being too broad. You know, in order for them to uh, perform a research, and others see it more as an obstacle to to everything that is being done. The, the truth, I, I believe, as, as nearly always is in between in terms of, of, of let's say, assessing as a controller what is needed um, in, in that context. So if personal data is needed um, to, to, to carry out an activity, this being a primary use or also secondary use, well, then arguing that, for example, data is, is fully anonymized when maybe it's not or you know, um, maybe data can be indeed, personal data can be re-identifiable re from anonymized uh, information. Well, then, then maybe it's not, it's not, it's not the best way forward. Um, and in that sense, uh, the, the GDPR still provides for some flexibility and for some rules. And indeed, I, 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 I'm not, let's say, also the, the EDPB um, has provided for guidance, for example, in the context, I don't know, of processing of personal data in the context of clinical trials and the interplay with the GDPR, etc., that has provided also, I guess, for, I believe, for important clarification as to how to do that while still, you know, complying with the GDPR uh, principles uh, and applying uh, the relevant safeguards that are also uh, listed in the, in the GDPR and in particular in Article 89. So I think, you know, the, the truth is in between. If a controller, uh, in light of the principle of accountability, still believes that personal data needs to be processed for a specific uh, activity is being related to primary or secondary use, uh, I am using the uh, the definitions of the HDS, but of course we know that in the GDPR there are there is a bit of a different um, uh, the terminology, um, but still, should the assessment uh, be made, and should there, you know, be a specific assessment that indeed you need to process specific personal data, and um, and so, still, this needs to be done in light of the principles of the GDPR. So, all of the ones that we already know, purpose limitation, data minimization, etc. If all of this is done in compliance with the GDPR and is argumented, so it is, it is, it is fully. Um, uh, let's say justified as to why one would need to do so. Uh, the GDPR does not oblige, does not mean um, oblige uh, practitioners or or research institutions. 
institutions or whoever needs to perform such activities to to do so so that is that is uh, important to to highlight that indeed uh, the gdpr should not be seen as an obstacle uh, to to processing personal data but an, as an enabler to do so in in light of its principles uh, excellent thank you thank you very much Veronique. uh now uh let me move to uh to yanni thank you for for being patient and uh, listening to this panel. Um, and we, you know, we're moving now into, into secondary data. You can obviously respond to a lot that you've heard thus far, uh, but you know, fin data is tried and, and, and tested and proven, and you know, it has been in, it's been working. Maybe you can let us know as uh, other member states are trying to uh, create their own versions. I know it's a, it'll be impossible for it to be uh, cut and paste, obviously. But uh, you know what? What recommendations can you give? And, uh, and and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ray. And uh, first of all, I could actually mention as, as well that we have been partners in, in uh, primary use as, as well with regard to um, cross-border uh, healthcare services. Uh, Finland and Estonia were the first ones back in two thousand nineteen. Uh, Enabling e-prescription. Yanni, services. I'm sorry, but you're coming in a little bit uh, soft. Can you just maybe fix the? Uh... Here we go. Can you hear me better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay, and, and there's some sort of echo in, in in this room. Uh, I was just mentioning that uh, Finland and Estonia, Estonia were the first countries back in 2019 enabling a. Uh, 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 e purchase services between, between our countries. So we were sort of pioneers. And actually, of the, all of the e purchase services and, and, and uh, patient summary services as well, uh, the portion of, of Finland and Estonia is 98% of the services. So, that, so it's, it's an actual use at the moment. Uh, regarding patient, patient summary, Finland is not in production yet, but we will be in production uh, as of next year. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and a year after that as, as well, uh, acting as A and B countries. So we're sort of pioneers regarding the primary use of, of cross-border health, health, health data um, and definitely the second, secondary use of, 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 it's not just health data, it's just, uh, health and social data and benefit data and sort of socioeconomic data. We have had um, FIN data, which is the one-stop shop, for secondary use purposes since also from 2019. Um, and we had strict time timetables in, in, in the legislation to build up the FIN data and FIN data services. I wouldn't recommend to have that strict timetables that we have had in, in the Finnish legislation. But of course, uh, what was the, how did we make it happen? It, it, it was the preliminary work before, before we even had uh, the legislation, we, we have had done uh, loads of cooperation with uh, all the different stakeholders for something like five years before, and, and uh, that continued. That was the key for success. In order to make this sort of uh, regulation, like EHDs, happen, you need to involve all the necessary, I would say, all the stakeholders from day one in order to make it happen and continue with that uh, cooperation with them. It just doesn't stop when the legislation has been passed and you need to enable services. I think the key for success uh, in order to make it happen for the secondary use part of this, yes, this proposal is the interplay with the data users. You know, they, they need to learn the new way of doing things. And it just does, doesn't happen in one day. It will take some time before they get uh, used to the new way of doing things. And the new way of doing things is, uh, the, the new, for example, the secure operating environments. Uh, they're going to be against it uh, at start. That's for sure. That's, that's what we notice in, in Finland. But once we have had those secure environments, and we actually have eight at, at the moment. It's not just the environment from, from Fin data. We have eight already. Uh, and, and in those environments, you, you have the best available tools, uh, which, is a, which is something that the data users really like. You know, you have the best possible tools. You can bring your own tools as well, but everything is done in a secure, compliant way. The second part, what you need is for the secondary use part, I, I need to emphasize this, is, 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 is the data holders. 
what would be the initiative for the data holders to, to work on, on getting the different data sets available and, and, and high quality of high quality as well, which they will still get the money from the data sets, even though they, if they don't do anything, anything to the data sets. Uh, so there needs to be some sort of initiative, some sort of reward for making the data sets uh, available. It's a lot of burden for the, for the data holders. Uh, I won't go into the details of what, what, what's the definition of the data holder because it's a problematic as the CDP and EDP has no in a joint opinion, for, for example. But so it's a lot of burden for, for data holders and there's going to be lots of data holders in Europe who have lots of obligations that they probably at the moment are not aware of and who knows when they will be aware of. And uh, you, those data holders usually don't spend money, don't, they don't have, have resources for this sort of doing. For example, um, um, making those uh, data sets av available and, 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 and making data set descriptions, for, ex for example, that you need to do. So because the system works, in order to find the data, you need to have data set descriptions, and you need to have a metadata catalog, uh, then probably a portal, probably a European portal, and that's the way you find data. Then you need to have some sort of a, um, quality and, and utility label for, for determining whether the, the data sets you get is, is, is of high quality or low quality. And, and then make the decision whether you want the, want, want the, want the data for your, for, for your specific purposes. And then you need to have the security of, of our environments where you process the data. And, and, and the third uh, uh, essential part of the cooperation is, is the data access bodies. Yeah, we have thin data and we have had it since, like I mentioned, since 2000, 2019. But, but the interplay of data users, data holders, and data access bodies is essential. They need to cooperate. If they don't cooperate, the system does not work. So that's what, what we have learned for, for, from the fin data uh, experience. And we're still working on it. We, we have had some growing up pains, uh, but uh, it's, getting, it's getting better. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if all these three different parties cooperate together, the system will be quicker. And if it's a quicker system, uh, the, the quality will be better as well uh, when you cooperate. And of course, if it's quicker, it, it reflects on the pricing, pricing as well. Um, so the data sets can be cheaper and, and the data permit uh, fees will be, will be low, lower as well. Yanni, thank you. Uh, That's going to be the, the finish experiences. So I, I've, so. Taken, I've taken five points that you said uh, that are all perfect. And you know, we could just stop the panel right here, to be honest, because you know, these are the points uh, that need to be said and the importance of stakeholder interaction. And I hope our letter that has 30 different uh, trade associations, NGOs, you know, patient groups coming together shows that we are unified. You know, they're, you know, we're not uh, trying to keep each other out. So, you know, even though some people that it's not true. Uh, we are working together and we see the value of what you have created in Finland. And let me ask you, uh, opt-in, opt-out? You went for the opt-out model. Why? Um, well, there were several reasons. For, for example, we have had a um, legislation regarding the secondary use actually for many years. And it has always been based on, on, on the uh, uh, Legislation, not just constant. Uh, uh, um, I think the practical reason, yes, is, 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 is that background that it has always usually been based on legislation. But uh, the way that um, Finnish citizens work, they tend to trust the, the authorities. So they trust the authorities that that the data that is processed for the secondary use purposes will be handled in in a proper way. In, and and of course, you. One way to gain that trust is, is to have these security operating environments. Um, and, and we haven't had many, many people uh, complaining about this um, um, solution that we have in, in, in Finland. And actually not many data subjects even use their rights. So they're happy that the data will be used for the, for the valuable secondary use purposes, but they know that they, they will be, their data will be handled in a safe and secure, se secure way. So we have the trust. At, 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 we have had to trust in Finland even before we have this secure uh, operating environment, but to have this sort of system 
um, um, of audited um, environments, um, it, 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 it's one, one, one of the key things to gain the trust of the, of the citizens. Thank you. Okay, Yanni, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. I'd like to go back to uh, Ankel. I'd like to shift this debate to uh, secondary use. And I think, Yanni, you've, you've done an excellent curtain raiser for us. Um, Ankel, and maybe this is a question to, as I go back to everybody on this panel, uh, and when we talk about secondary health data, we're really trying, as I said in the beginning, to address health equity. Uh, there are medical des deserts now appearing in, in uh, cities in France that have no access to, to, to doctors. You know, treatments of some of the worst diseases need to be addressed, and Europe has to be resilient uh, in the face of pandemics. So I'd like you to, to give your views in regards to secondary data and innovating to address these challenges. Uh, but also, uh, just for you maybe, uh, and I, I wanna bring in the audience a little bit. I've seen uh, Mark Diedrich, thank you very much for, for uh, all the different questions. We can't address them all. Uh, I know others have asked questions, but there's this one about five safes. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, let me, let me maybe start from, from your first question or the first part of your question, um, Ray, I think. The clear thing uh, that we face today is that um, data is still in silos. It's very difficult to aggregate. It's very difficult to actually have representative data sets to understand what's going on, not only with an individual patient, but also at a population level. So there is already a challenge today in trying to address some of those uh, needs, as you said, uh, that can be in very, uh, let's say, very populated areas in big cities, but also, as you said, in rural areas, now where we can see those type of deserts. So the first thing is really how we can tear down those silos and get a better understanding. And, and COVID was an example, right? I think I, I heard also from, from Veronique, and I think uh, she's right, that there is a very good guidance there. But the reality was that uh, during COVID-19, researchers couldn't really collaborate because they were facing very fragmented landscape. So even if I think the right motivations were there, I think the, all the goodwill from public authorities, researchers, everyone was there. It was difficult really to collaborate because of the way we've been fragmenting the implementation and the and the and the requirements of the different um, of the different aspects. So that created a I would say I would say uh, those silos to be really really uh, hard to to overcome. Um, but we can see huge potential when we're doing collaborations um, uh, with hospitals and uh, in trying to understand better certain diseases like uh, cancer. I um, mean, you can talk about blood cancer, uh, multiple myeloma. Uh, there is huge opportunity actually to get better understanding of the disease um, and also potentially provide a more personalized care. So get developed algorithms that will really tell you which patients do need which type of treatment. And that's possible with data science, but you, we need more collaboration. I think, as Johnny said, uh, they really can uh, break down those, those silos. So for us, there is huge opportunity. The European health data space could be, I would say, also a model of inspiration for other uh, data sharing. So not everything is going to happen within the EHDS. Things can also happen outside the European health data space. Um, and I think, again, the key essential uh, element to that is trust, is collaboration. Um, but we need to aggregate, be able more to aggregate data, anonymize data. Um, now, to your point about the, the question from, from Mark, I think there are many different aspects of the European health space which are covering these uh, five safes. Uh, I think the first uh, reference we should make really is that a listing principle, um, and obviously I will rely on the experts, so Veronique, please keep me honest, um, the, the European Health Data Space is inspired by the seven principles of GDPR. So in principle, at least in the recitals, it's been covered there. Now, the implementation, interpretation, that's maybe for discussion. Um, we also can see that in terms of uh, projects and processes, uh, I think uh, the European Health Data Space is certainly trying to cover safe, also even the secure processing environment. So there are elements in the European Health Data Space which are really privacy and security by design, as we claimed at the beginning, uh, which are really essential. Uh, now, as we said before, it's, and you and you pointed at that uh, very well, Ray, is how many secure uh, processing environments are we gonna have? I mean, those implementations uh, aspects are gonna be essential for this to be successful. 
Uh, but again, I really want to finalize with the aspect that I really like what Johnny said. I think you can have all the rules, all the infrastructure, all the processes, all the legislation. If there is no collaboration or cooperation, this is not going to work. And I think that's really an essential uh, takeaway for me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to start jumping around. I want everyone to have an opportunity to speak a second time. Sarah, uh, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of different areas. Um, but, you know, what about you? What about when it comes to uh, 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 secondary research, um, you know, the MEP said maybe it's not, you know, the, the core area for a healthcare practitioner, but is there something you'd, you'd want to say on, on this? Uh, yes, so um, on the secondary use, uh, uh, a key point for us is the respect of principle of medical ethics and, and confidentiality. And here, uh, and I think this has been debated in other uh, fora, Article 33.5 uh, puts this into jeopardy. So uh, for us, there has to be, uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, certain ethical requirements that are foreseen at national legislation cannot be jeopardized. And in some cases, it's the involvement of ethic committees. In other situations, you need to get prior consent uh, from patients. Uh, and this has to play a role so that it is also cannot be burdensome because sometimes there can be consent fatigue um, uh, by patients to give access to information uh, every time. So this, this can be balanced uh, in a way that uh, um, or, or even the, the patient is not able to provide consent. So this needs to be balanced in a way that uh, that, that works, but without compromising those uh, principles. And uh, yes, for us, uh, this data economy should not lead to unequitable access to healthcare. And, and we also believe that if someone is not willing to provide data for secondary use, they should not uh, be uh, or suffer any discriminatory effects uh, on this regard. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, Veronique, let's move to you. I've heard the word uh, consent fatigue. How do we avoid it? Uh, any views uh, in regards to secondary data you'd like to, to say that you haven't said already? <laughs> well, the, the consent fatigue is, is, is real. So maybe here I would just say um, one thing that, um, for example, in time, the DPB has been moving away from consent and has made that clear also in the um, guidance, um, so in the opinion on the interplay between the clinical trials regulation and the GDPR. If you uh, see that when uh, we read the, the guidance there, the opinion, when uh, the DPB speaks about uh, scientific research, um, so yeah, indeed, so in terms of, of research, the, the DPB moves away from consent and what it does is also clarify the, the difference between consent to participate in a clinical trial uh, from consent within the meaning of the GDPR. And this is something that I always try and, and underline very well in terms of, okay, consent may not always be, especially in the context of scientific research, the best legal basis to be used depends it depends of course this is also complicated by the fact that at national level uh, some member states uh, have a clear preference and even indeed uh, legislative uh, decision as to the use of consent um, and so um, my hope is that indeed the health data space will uh, sort of uh, overcome a bit this issue of the legal basis whilst However, on the other hand, um, it is also true that um, the, uh, the, for example, in the context of secondary use, the, the, the activities that fall within the, the scope of scientific uh, of uh, secondary use within the HDS proposal are also too broad at this point in time. So that may create, you know, the, the issue is the, as also defined uh, and identified in the opinion is that, okay, this is a good step in overcoming a bit this fragmentation of use of legal basis between national member states. But then when it comes to what is encompassed uh, amongst the, the definition of secondary use may then create problems in applying a specific legal basis or not. Uh, so uh, my hope is that indeed this may be uh, clarified or you know distinguished a bit clearly in the in the proposal. But yes, in terms of consent, indeed, uh, I would refer you to, the, 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 to that opinion. I would refer also the audience to that opinion because it is also quite clear that the DPB is trying to uh, provide also guidance in terms of uh, moving, moving away from 
consent also within the meaning of the GDPR, but to try and find another appropriate legal basis sometimes to, to be able to move forward. And Very now, yeah, hopefully, we need to resolve only the fragmentation part, but hopefully with the guidelines and, and the proposal, um, maybe it will happen. Uh, very, very valuable points and, and, and emphasizes your comment that uh, you are also a key stakeholder in this discussion that needs to be involved. Uh, let's now shift the discussion uh, back to our first uh, speakers, uh, uh, to industry. Uh, if I can go to, uh, to Dimitri and, 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 you know, as Oracle, you know, we're looking at health data, how it's managed, secure processing environments, you know, uh, federated models, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of, you know, in very briefly, what, what kind of comments can you say to help make, you know, secondary research a, a real thing and a powerful tool? Yeah, thank you, Ray. And <clears throat> this, is, this is very insightful to hear, you know, all different opinions about, you know, how we collect data, how we capture data, the primary use and how we try to make use of this data for the secondary purposes. And I think that <clears throat> the key here for me probably is data quality. So today we define pretty well what we collect and how we exchange data in primary use. But this is very limited data sets, very limited. So we've got like Yoni said, like even advanced countries like, like Finland. So they, they managed to exchange e-prescriptions, they onboarding to patient summaries. They've been developed a specification for uh, hospital discharge letters, for radiology images, but that's about it. So this is something that we've specified and we are trying to capture. The rest of the data and probably the major interesting, most rich data don't, don't come and are not specified so far through the primary use capturing. So that all comes probably today from other projects. So like if we look at Nordics, like Sweden, for example, there's, there is a lot of like, there's a lot of re registers, disease registers that are built and being built and maintained. And they are actually the source of information for secondary use. So we've got another silo or something that, you know, Antti also mentions, like this is still all siloed. Even when we look at EHDS, we are still figuring out that there's a lot of elements that are not governed at all. So we need to populate secondary data also say even those secure environments with data that is not governed and we don't actually understand how this data was collected so every still every member state decides how they populate those registries same goes to genomic data we don't have any regulation today any position about of ehds about genomic data this is huge source data for for research for secondary use and we do some diff other different projects. I mean, there is a lot of things going on in the projects like 1 million plus genome, beyond 1 million plus genome. There is genomic data infrastructure, but again, that sits outside of the EHDS. So they also implement the information models. Are they gonna fit? What is that we're gonna be able to do? So we've got the primary, the genomic data, the registries across member states. How are we gonna make this available cohesively for member states for the research that remains to be seen? It's, it's, it's great comment. Are we going to have another regulation like the GDPR that's going to create more fragmentation or are we going to solve the fragmentation? And I think that's a question that we all have to answer in, in this dialogue. And Victoria, you have the final word. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I think listening to all the experts today, um, I think we have <clears throat> a lot of work ahead of us. I think we are very enthusiastic about it and we will need all the stakeholders on board for this. Um, again, um, I very much agree that cooperation will be probably one of the key building blocks to make the HDS happen mm -hmm. and to make it a success. And I think we all have the, the, the main goals in mind and we will be excited to, to work on this in, in the years and hopefully not long years to come. Excellent, Victoria. And I want to reiterate their first point that you made at the beginning of, uh, of this journey that we had this morning, that we got to make sure the AI Act and the Data Act and now the DJ that's been published are not undermining, you know, the value of what we're trying to achieve here for health equity and innovation. Uh, and of course, this is all about the patients, right, and European citizens. So thank you very much to everybody who has been listening today. Uh, we've covered a very broad range of areas and I can't cover it all uh, in uh, the time uh, that I have left, but I just wanna leave you with one thought that uh, the EU moved mountains uh, when COVID hit 
The member states came together from regions to many different sides and political parties to make COVID certificates happen uh, and try to overcome a pandemic. And, you know, that should be a learning. Let's move mountains to make the EHDS happen. Let's not lose uh, the main purpose of what this regulation is trying to achieve and come together as all stakeholders uh, for the future of, of patients and healthcare. And I thank everybody very much uh, for their time. We will have a recording of this that we'll share with everybody. And please uh, stay on our events page as we have many other exciting events coming up in the near future. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.